Well, here we are on another Wednesday. It is time to what? It's time to get in this word. It is time to make sure that we get this word in us. Amen. Welcome to another Wednesday in the Word. And thank you so much for joining us on this Wednesday, Hump Day, September the 22nd, 2021. I pray your strength in the Lord. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. Of course, we we'll always bring you greetings on behalf of our First Baptist Church family. And we send out a big shout out. A great thanks to our friends and followers on Facebook, YouTube, and anywhere else you're listening or watching from. We appreciate you. It is always a joy for us to come together on a Wednesday. Amen? But i got to ask you, are you doing your homework? <laughs> Study to show thyself approved unto God, a worker that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. And you know what he says in Acts 17 and 11? These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, studied, amen, studied the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Study that word. I tell you all the time, the word works and it'll work for you. Amen. Well, today we are going to go to another one of our favorite Bible stories. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, somewhat the story of um, uh, David and Goliath. We're actually going to be talking about our topic or our subject today is uh, when confronted with conflict. When we are confronted with conflict. And we're going to examine uh, that today. But we begin this story so-called story of David and Goliath, which actually begins in 1 Samuel, uh, but it actually continues throughout the Bible because David is always, once David arrives on the scene, he is always a part of what's happening in the Bible. Amen? So we're going to take a look at that today. Again, we're going to talk about when confronted with conflict. And you know as well as I that we're faced with conflict of one kind or another uh, every day. So we're going to look at this story that most of us learned as children in Sunday school. We love the story of David and Goliath, where the little guy overcomes the big guy. Amen? And uh, you were always glad to hear when when uh, uh, the, uh, what, what do they call it, the uh, the underdog, that's what they call it, the underdog. <laughs> We're always glad when the underdog can win. Okay, so in this case, the so-called underdog is David. And of course, David wins. So we're going to look at 1 Samuel. We're going to go ahead and jump into the scripture right now, and then we'll talk a little bit about it. But 1 Samuel chapter number 17, and we're going to focus on verses 19 through 30. Uh, but you want to read the whole thing. I mean, the, like I said, the story goes on and on. Uh, but, you know, that can be part of your Bible reading. But we're going to focus primarily on, uh, on on chapter number 17 and verses 19 through 30. And, uh, and of course, I'm always looking uh, and coming from the King James Version of the Bible. Always from the King J James Version of the Bible. But beginning with, uh, let me get to the right place. Uh, uh, first Samuel chapter 17 and beginning with verse number uh, 19. Again, I'm going to read through the scriptures, make a few comments on the scriptures, and then we're going to uh, get into the body, so to speak, of our uh, discussion for today. And again, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm excited about what God is doing, even in, in spite of a pandemic, in the midst of a pandemic, God is still blessing. Yes, yes, we, we have some struggles. We have some issues that we have to deal with, uh, but just remember that God is still on the throne and God is still in control. I know it looks like things are out of control, but God is still in control. Amen? Amen. Beginning with verse number 19, it says, Now Saul, uh, Saul, the king of uh, Israel, now Saul, verse 19, and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Eliah fighting with the Philistines, that the Philistines, their forever enemy, <laughs> amen, they, they were there, 
preparing uh, for, to do battle. And uh, they were there somewhat, uh, not so much jockeying for a position, but uh, they were there. And of course, we know that Goliath was there trying to intimidate. And we, well, in fact, he did intimidate them, intimidate uh, the, the, the men of God. And then uh, David comes on the scene here, says, uh, uh, and David, verse 20, rose up early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. In other words, his father had sent some uh, provisions out to the uh, uh, men on the battlefield, particularly to the uh, leaders, to the captains and the leaders of the troops on the battlefield. So Jesse sends David out there. Uh, uh, little does he know that at that point, David's whole life will be transformed. Amen. So he sends him out there to take provisions uh, to the troops, uh, again, to the uh, captains, to the leaders of the troops. So it says in uh, the leaders of the troops, I should say. And David rose up early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, took and went as Jesse commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was uh, going forth to the fight. Listen, they were, they were about to engage in battle. At least that was what we thought anyway. And, uh, and, and shouted for the battle. They're, they're out there shouting. They're getting ready. They're, they're ready to go. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. There they are. This is a confrontation in itself. There they are, ready to do battle. Then verse number 22, it says, uh, And uh, David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage, ran, listen, ran into the uh, 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 army. Ran into the, in other words, he ran into the thick of things. He was not trying to avoid, in this sense, see, let me tell you something, because I'm going to talk about this later, how to stay out of things. But when God ordains it, when God anoints you to do it, don't you ever insert yourself into a situation, but there are times that God will drop you right smack dab in the middle of a fight. Yes, he will. <laughs> yes, he will. Don't do that on your own. Now. But when God puts you there or when God sends you there, then rise up, my friend, and be obedient because God has you covered, okay? So as David left the carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage, ran into the army, came and saluted his brother and spoke to his brothers, spoke to his fellow countrymen, if you will. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. Listen, listen to what he says now, because while he is talking and greeting uh, his brothers, while he is out there on the battlefield now, not yet engaged in battle, but talking to his brothers out there. As they are talking, then uh, Goliath, I mean, an imposing figure on the other side of the valley, Goliath comes out and struts his stuff across the scene. <laughs> Amen. And listen to what the scriptures tells us. It says, uh, and, uh, and uh, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. In other words, it sounds like this is something that he had been doing all along, coming out threatening people and trying to intimidate people. Sounds like something that he had been up to prior to David's arrival there on the battlefield. David heard the words, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, when they saw Goliath, when they saw how huge their problem was, I'm talking to somebody, when they saw uh, how huge he was, they ran, they fled. I believe that's what the Bible says. When they saw the man, fled from him, and was sore afraid. They were scared, so afraid. The men of Israel, the men and the men of Israel said, "Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. This is a reason come up to defy uh, Israel." Amen. And then it says, uh, uh, "And it shall be uh, that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him." His daughter make his father's house free in Israel. Says all we need is somebody to go down there and kill this giant. Get rid of this problem. 
And there are people who are glad to tell you about what needs to be done. Oh, God, don't let me stop there. There are people who are glad to tell you about what needs to be done, but they're not willing to do it. Yeah, they, they'll tell you what needs to be done. I mean, I hear people all the time talking about, uh, you know, well, the, the, you know, the government needs to do this and uh, the people need to do that. And, and, and especially when they start talking about the church and preachers. Well, you know, the, the churches and the preachers, it's time for them to stand up and be counted. Well, I'm standing up and I'm counted. <laughs> and there are many other around me that are standing up and they are counted. There are people out there who always want to tell you what needs to be done, but they themselves are not willing to do it. I, you heard me. I just asked God not to let me stop there. So let me go on, okay? Because I could really preach right there. I really could. But here they are. They are not willing to do anything, but they want to tell everybody else what needs to be done. Okay? And, and so, you know, and the king has made this offer available. So they are just uh, letting it be known that this offer is available. Verse number 26. David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? and taking away the reproach from Israel. What will free our nation? What will free us as a people? What does it take for somebody to get rid of this guy who continues to, listen, who continues to embarrass the people of God? And that's the way some of us allow the devil to come into our lives and embarrass, embarrass us as people of God. You know, while we always talk about, I'm blessed and highly favored, great as he was in me, than he that is in the world. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And yet, when the devil shows up, we're on the run. We're on the run. So David wants to know, wait a minute, what is all this about? Oh, he's there, he thinks, and everybody else thinks, he's only there to bring provisions to the captains of the army. You know, Jesse sent him out there for that specific purpose. Okay? But once he gets there... Uh, uh, in a sense, reality begins to shut, uh, set in. Reality begins to set in, and I think that it becomes clear to those of us who are Bible readers and understand to some degree God and how he operates. I think we are seeing by now that this is the hand of God. This is the hand of God. It, it wasn't just that Jesse sent him out there, but God sent him out there. Amen? Yeah, he did. God sent him out there. So look at what he says here in verse number 20. Uh, 26, again, it says, And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What should be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? And take it away, the reproach. Take it away from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Who is this guy that everybody's running from? Who is this guy that everybody's talking about? Who is this guy that is scaring everybody? Amen? Who is he? Who is he? He said that, that he should defy the armies of the living God. Who is he? that he should put us to flight? Who is he that he should intimidate us? Who is he that he should frighten us? So David just wants to know, hey, you know, like we might say, you know, I'm just asking, <laughs> you know, who is this guy? All right. Then verse number 27, people answered him after this manner. This is what they said. So shall it be done to the man that killed him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, Heard when he spake unto the men. Heard when he spoke. His older brother, one of those that fled, the one that ought to be there setting an example. When he heard what David said, listen, all of a sudden now, anger and hatred begins to arise in him. Look at what happens. Eliab, listen, and Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab, uh, anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why camest thou down here? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? Now all of a sudden, he's finding fault in David. I thought you were a sheep keeper. Why aren't you there keeping your sheep? Who, who did you leave those sheep with? That is just like some of us. You know, we, we want to tell you what needs to be done, but we don't want to do it. And then when we try to do something, when we step in, not just when we step in, but when God places us there to bring some answers, to do something about the situation, when God places us there, then all of a sudden people want to criticize us. Who asked you? Who told you to come down here? Who needs you? Well, apparently y'all need me. You're running everywhere. Everybody's scared. Everybody's afraid of this Goliath. All right? So he's angry with David. The Bible says his anger was kindled against David. Why have you come down here? 
And then he says, uh, 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 and with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. You're just down here to watch. You're just a little tight. There's nothing you can do. You have no business out here on the battlefield. Listen, wherever God sends you, my friend, you have business there. That's why he sent you. He didn't send you there to lollygag around. He didn't send you there to socialize. When God sends you somewhere, he sends you there to take care of business. Are you hearing me? Uh, I said, are you hearing me? There are too many, far too many men and women of God whom God has placed in places to do business, but they are so intimidated by the enemy. They are so afraid of the enemy that they flee. They, they, they close their mouths. They don't say a mumbling word. When, listen, or they begin to skin and grin, the shuffle and all of that. Listen, when God sends you somewhere, when God places you somewhere, you, my friend, are there to handle business. You're not there to uh, try to crawl into bed with everybody. I mean, in the sense of, you know, in a political sense, you're not there to try to uh, influence everybody in that way where you're trying to become friends with them. You are there to take care of business. And when God sends you to take care of business, when it involves the devil, you are not there to handle things as we call it with kid gloves. <laughs> I'm not here to kid around. I'm not here to play around. I'm not here to try to get close to people and try to influence people and try to fit into their circles. When God sends you there to wreck the place, wreck it. When God sends you there to tear it down, tear it down. When God sends you there to pull it up, pull it up. God sends you there to take care of business. Amen. Then look at verse number 28. Then we look at 28. Uh, yeah, look at verse 29. David said again, what have I done now? What have I done? David says, listen, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? You know, you're complaining and criticizing me by being here. God has sent me to bring you some help to deliver you. And here you are complaining. Is there not a reason for me to be here? Is there not a reason for God to intervene on our behalf at this particular time? Yes, there is a cause. There is a cause. Amen. So it says, and David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? And then verse number uh, uh, 30. Uh, then it says, and he turned from him toward another, spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. When the words were heard which David spake, they were rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. Yeah, that, that, that's kind of what people do. That's kind of what they do. You know, they, they criticize, they complain, uh, and then they go and report you to the boss. <laughs> you know, uh, David is out here, and nobody asked him to come out here, and, and he's out here, you know what they're going to say, he's out here starting trouble. He's out here interfering. <laughs> and that's what they're going to say about you. They're going to say, nobody asked her to come out here. Nobody told her to say anything. Oh, yes, my friend, you may not know that God has sent them, but God told them to be there. God told them what to say. God told them what to do. Amen. And, and so when oh God help me, when God, listen, when God sends you deliverance, don't fight against that deliverance. Amen. Amen. Do not fight against it. Don't fight against it. When God has, has given you a way out. Then take that way out. When God has blessed you and when God has sent you finally your miracle that you've been waiting on, don't fight against it. Embrace it. Accept it and thank God for it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I know sometimes God will use people that we, uh, I mean, that would be our last thought. What, David, this boy? This is a battlefield. This is where grown folk <laughs> belong. This is where warriors belong. There are why so many wimps out there then. God knows what he's doing. And God sends David out there. And David says, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? So David, listen, David was prepared to confront the conflict. <laughs> yeah, God had prepared him. He was prepared to confront the conflict. He was there to take on the challenge, so to speak. Amen. You know, it doesn't speak very well of our society, nor does it bode very well uh, for us 
as a people or as a nation to say that the day in which we live, conflict has seemingly become prominent and permanent in our society. I mean, it's like a prominent and permanent fixture on the American landscape. It's everywhere. Conflict comes in different varieties and different levels of intensity. And I would venture to say that we live in a very hostile environment these days where attacks are coming from every side, from every corner, and from within as well as from without. Yes, my friend, there are internal struggles. There are internal conflicts that demand much of our time and our energy. And there are external attacks where it is beginning to look like even previously trusted friends are looking like and acting like enemies. <laughs> we, don't hardly, we hardly know who to trust these days. From the time we get up to the time we bed down, we have to be prepared to engage in battle. You know, it reminds me of growing up. It reminds me of my days, uh, what we call in the hood, in, in the violent environment of inner city living. And it reminds me of my combat duty in Vietnam, where every day was a day uh, where we, it was battling your way out and then battling your way back in and fighting for survival the whole while in between. That there was no break, you know, especially on the battlefield. You know, now back in the hood, of course, we had some good neighbors and uh, there were some good neighbors and, and we had some good times. So it wasn't exactly, you know, like that all the time, fighting all the time. But on any given day or any given time, it could have been just that bad or even worse. And it was that bad. It was that, you know, worse than that in the jungles of Vietnam when we were on high alert every day, all day long. I mean, not a break. It was all day uh, high alert and, and focused and, and, and staying ready all the time. You cannot afford to let your guard down, so to speak. All right? You know, and life sometimes can be a contradiction where, yes, we grow tired and we grow weary of battle. And yet, for our own sake and for our own survival, we have to remain battle ready. I mean, battle ready at all times. We may not like fighting, but life demands that we fight. I'm not talking about fighting for the sake of fighting, but fighting, you know, fighting uh, for survival in the way that God guides us and leads us to fight. Amen? Because, listen, we're dealing with some things in our lives, and, and, and I mean, it looks like the, the devil is on a rampage. It was so many things working against us and so much weighing upon us. If we don't fight, we can easily become consumed by the conflicts of life. And some of us feel in it now. Some of us may be even at that point now where we are consumed by the conflicts. For any nation, for any person to enjoy peace, it's necessary to be ready, to be prepared and equipped to fight. You know, unfortunately, some people love to fight. And, they, and some people deliberately promote conflict. They love conflict. And, you know, they love it. They, all, they love all the nonsense, the mess, the drama that, that go along with conflict. And many wouldn't even know what to do without it. That, that's all they know. That's what they like. That's what they do. But let me tell you something, my friend. One of the things that I learned from uh, 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 war, one of the things I learned from law enforcement, that some, there's some people who haven't learned this lesson yet, but one of the things that I learned, and, and, and I guess I'm still learning, is that um, uh, you know, none of us like to kill. You know, I, I hate to think that there are people who actually like it. There, of course, there are some. But this is what I learned, a very, uh, an invaluable lesson, that a warrior doesn't kill just for the sake of killing. A warrior only kills when it's necessary or when they perceive that it's necessary to kill. You don't just kill because you can you know, and I think this is a lesson that we need to learn, not only as soldiers, but as law enforcement, as people, as, as citizens, that there's something we don't do just because we can do it. Amen? We ought to value life more than that. I know I'm kind of off topic a little bit there, but I think I'm, I'm on it. Amen. Go ahead and tell me. You're on it, Pastor. Tell me. I'm on. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay? So the question, my friend, <laughs> the question is not if we are confronted with conflict, but when we are confronted with conflict. Not, not, not if, because we're going to be confronted with it. Listen, what will our reaction be? What should it be? What will our response be? What should it be? I mean, especially if there's an imminent danger or an immediate threat, whether that's perceived or if it's real, you know, 
I, I love it. I, lo I love the idea of combating conflict. But that thought just kind of suggests that it's possible to eliminate or to avoid conflict altogether. And I'm not really sure that, you know, that that's, that's a true statement. There are ways in which we can avoid initiating or causing conflict, but that doesn't, you know, that doesn't mean conflict won't come to us. Amen. And I certainly think that we ought to do all that we can uh, uh, within ourselves uh, to avoid conflict. We ought to uh, do all that we can as far as we can control to eliminate, uh, to avoid, and to prevent conflict. Okay. But that's on our part. I mean, obviously, it is to our benefit to avoid conflict and to steer clear of conflict whenever possible. That's to our benefit. That's our advantage. You know, and so therefore, I believe that we should be proactive and take the necessary steps to keep the uh, the atmosphere uh, within our reach clear of conflict. Uh, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 12 and verse number 18, if it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Amen. So there are preventive measures that we can take in dealing with conflict, but we must recognize that we are actually fighting on the two fronts. Amen? So we have to uh, uh, map our strategy accordingly because we're fighting on two fronts. We are, we are, we are. We are challenged. Listen, um, the challenge for us is, is, number one, carry ourselves in such a way and behave in such a way that we don't cause conflict, okay? And number two, uh, that we are challenged by the fact that we are, have to be prepared to properly confront conflict when it does come our way. Okay, so we're battling on two fronts. One is, is we have to do all we can to avoid and prevent conflict. But uh, on the other hand, when conflict comes, we must be ready to deal with it. Okay, but the first order of business is to, to uh, control ourselves, uh, to do what we can do within ourselves uh, to make sure that we uh, avoid conflict, to be sure that we are on the right track and doing the right thing. That's our responsibility. And if anything, we ought to be to, and I don't know this, this doesn't sound good, but if anything, we ought to be the victim and not the villain. Okay? We, we are not to be the initiator of conflict. Okay? But we ought to be ready to deal with it when it does come our way. Yeah, I mean, our preference is not to find ourselves in, in, a, in a threatening situation but definitely not the cause. We don't want to be the cause of the situation, okay? Because if that happens, then we got to answer to God, okay? So let me give you a couple of things that I believe is going to help us today uh, on this beautiful Wednesday. Uh, the number one thing I want to say to us, to us is this. Avoid, as much as you can, avoid argumentative situations, okay? Avoid argumentative situations situations. Now, why do I say that? I say that because, uh, I think for somewhat obvious reasons, because arguments can lead to much more. Things can escalate so quickly. I mean, you could, it, it happens to the best of us. Save, sanctified, feel with the Holy Ghost. It happens to the best of us. So the best thing is to avoid argumentative situations, okay? When, when you see an argument brewing, escape. Get out of that situation immediately. Back down. Talk yourself down. Before you start trying to talk anybody else down, get yourself under control. Focus on what you need to focus on, okay? But avoid argumentative situations because they can be explosive situations. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Okay, so uh, uh, that's one thing that we can do to help ourselves to avoid and to prevent uh, conflict. Amen? Avoid angry, and this is almost kind of similar, but avoid angry and hostile situations. <laughs> Amen? If you see a fire, stay out of it. If, if, if you find yourself in a fire, get out of it. Avoid those situations. And, you know, and sometimes it's dangerous even for us to try to talk people out of anger and hostility. Because oftentimes, even if we are not directly involved, people will turn on us, you know. So avoid those situations. Keep yourself as safe as possible, okay. Avoid angry 
And of course, you don't want to be the one that's angry, and you don't want to be the one that's hostile. So that's the, that's the first order of business, is not being angry and not being hostile, okay? But avoid those angry and hostile situations. And in any situation, listen, uh, we are children of God. We are disciplined people of God. Uh, God, we are people who have self-control. We are people who are led by the Holy Spirit of God, okay? So since we are, let us uh, uh, demonstrate poise, demonstrate patience, and demonstrate restraint and self-control. Let us show the world that we can do it. Let us show the world that the power of God is working in us, that even in the most... Uh, 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 con and, and no matter what kind of conflict it is, uh, that we can remain uh, in a position of, uh, of restraint and we can restrain ourselves and we can be poised and we can stay calm and collected, all of that, uh, that we can keep our cool, so to speak, okay? We, we don't want to be people who are explosive, all right? We don't want anybody to be there standing there with a match ready to light our fuse, Okay, so demonstrate poise, patience, and restraint, and self-control. All right, and, and you know we all react and we all respond differently, um, but as people of God, God has made a way for us to deal with these um, conflicts and deal with these what could be uh, potentially explosive situations. Okay, then the next thing I want to say to us is this: exhibit character. Character. Always take the high road. Always take the high road. Character, character, Christian character. Amen? Amen. And uh, don't, don't ever feel like, uh, you know, in certain situations, you got to win all the time. And, and, and don't feel like just because you uh, exhibit or demonstrate patience or, uh, or character that you are weak. That's a sign of strength, not a sign of weakness, not weakness, my friend. So exhibit character and always take the high road. Always take the high road. Okay, and uh, and let, let me say this because I talked about this earlier, uh, a little while ago. Uh, allow you know, don't feel like you got to win all the time. Allow a small victory. Go ahead and let a, uh, allow a small victory for the greater good. <laughs> that that little give and take that you did, that little surrendering, the small victory, can lead to greater good. Amen. That one time that you restrained yourself, oh yeah, I could have tore them up. I could have tore into them, but I restrained myself. That little small victory that you gave them is for the greater good. You don't know what you avoided, what you prevented, what you saved, amen, what you salvaged by that small victory that you were willing to give up. Okay, you know, back in the day, uh, the, you, know, you don't hear this much anymore, but back in the day, folk would say, uh, that sometimes we have to give up our rights for somebody else's wrong. That's the way they used to say it. We have to give up our rights for somebody else's wrong. And many times people have done that. People have, oh God, thank you. People have allowed us victories that we did not deserve. Yeah. People have allowed, they could have had us. They could have destroyed us. They could have done us in. They didn't have to, but they let us off the hook. They provided a small victory that turned out to be for the greater good. They gave up their rights for our own. They blessed us with victory when we deserved defeat. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Hey, thank you, Lord. I say, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Then show genuine compassion. Show sensitivity towards the other person or the other persons. Show that you are a person of compassion, a person who is sensitive to the needs of others, sensitive to the problems that others may have. Are you hearing me? Then let me say this to you. And, uh, uh, and I think this is one of the most important things. Discourage others, but first within you. Refuse. Did you hear what I said? Refuse to indulge in gossip, mess, and drama. Now, I said you refuse before you try to discourage anybody else. Refuse to indulge in gossip, mess, and drama. 
stay out of it and refuse to be a drop off point for garbage. Some of us ought to be collecting for our rental uh, dumpsters yeah, because that, that's what some of us have become, dumpsters, where people stop by and drop off their garbage to us. You ought to be charging a fee for, for allowing people to drop off and for you taking it. In fact, you ought, to, you ought to be charging a fee and you ought to be paying a penalty. <laughs> you ought to charge them a fee and you ought to be paying a penalty for allowing them to drop off their garbage. You should not be a dumpster for people to bring their garbage. Stay out of it, okay? All right? Are you hearing me? Listen, refuse to indulge in drama and mess. Are you hearing what I'm saying? All right? Now, the next one is, is, is very closely connected to that one because I want to stay, say, stay in your lane and stay out of other folks' business. I said stay in your lane and stay out of other folks' business. Are you hearing me? <laughs> I told you I was going to get to this because I mentioned to you earlier, when God inserts you somewhere, you're good to go. But stop inserting yourself. Stop dropping yourself in the affairs of other people. Stop inviting yourself in other people's business. Are you hearing me? I mean, you and I have enough to tend to as it is. Stay out of other folk business. Stop butting in, inviting, listen, inviting yourself in other people's business. Because butting in and inviting yourself will generate conflict quicker than almost anything that I know. Getting in somebody else's business. When nobody, not only did they not ask you there, but God did not send you there. When you do that, it's an invitation to conflict. It's almost as if we're saying, here's my nose, <laughs> please chop it off. And send me on back home. <laughs> and of course, there are some people out there who will very happily oblige you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Amen. Let me close with a few thoughts. Then we're out of here. When confronted with conflict, uh, you may not understand this right now, but think about it a little while. When confronted with conflict, it requires more than a reaction. It requires more than a response. And I'm talking about even when it looks like, uh, you know, it's a kind of a, you know, a split second situation where, you know, you need to do something now or it's going to be too late. But it requires more than a reaction. Yeah, we have to react, we have to respond, but it requires more than that. It requires thought. It requires prayer. It requires training. This is what Paul was talking about when he says, I, I discipline myself, I beat my body, I bring it under control. And this is what we have to do, not, not when the time comes, but we do it prior to that time in advance. It requires thought. And these, listen, and uh, these are thoughts that need to be flushed out and prepared for in advance. So we have to discipline ourselves, train ourselves. Uh, uh, Paul says, I, I bring my body under subjection. In other words, I, I'm in control of this situation. And we have to do it in advance. That, that's why before a game is played, whatever game, whatever competition it might be, whatever game is played, whatever is done, uh, there, there's practice prior to that. There's preparation prior to that. You know, uh, before um, singing can be done, there's rehearsal. Uh, before the battles are fought, the troops have to be taught, they have to be trained, they have to be equipped, they have to be prepared. Okay? So we don't wait till we get in the situation to try to figure it out. Uh, we, we prepare for it. Okay? All right. Now, it, it requires thought because here's what we have to do. We have to, first of all, consider the cause of the conflict. What is the cause? Because I may be the cause. What is the cause? Who is the cause? It could be me. It could be somebody else. It could be this. It could be that. And, uh, and, and uh, so the cause can really determine how we respond to it. The cause of it can really determine if and how we react to it. So we have to consider the cause, okay? Then, uh, secondly, along those lines, those, those lines of thought, is that we have to consider the casualty count, the risk, or, or what could possibly be lost in this situation. Uh, that's going to help me determine my reaction and my response, okay? Uh, uh, who's going to be lost in this situation? Uh, friendships can be lost. Relationships can be lost. Uh, so we have to consider all of that. 
uh, you know, before we react, before we react, and before we respond, because again, that may uh, determine our will. As a matter of fact, it will help determine how we react and how we respond, or when, and so forth and so on. Okay, uh, and we don't want uh, resources, and we don't want friendships. We don't want we don't want relationships to be lost unnecessarily. We don't want people to be lost unnecessarily. Okay, then we have to consider the collateral damage, the damage that would be done, and and those who would be hurt, uh, who had absolutely nothing to do with the situation, innocent bystanders, we call them, right? There's that collateral damage that we have to think about, that uh, if, if we're going to fight, if we're going to respond, if we're going to react, who might be hurt that has nothing to do with it? Who might be hurt in the process? What damage may be done in the process, all right? So it requires more than just reaction. It requires more than just a response. We have to think about it. We have to prepare. We have to pray about it. Are you hearing me? You know, not everybody react or respond the same way. You know, I want to give you five options real quick. Five options. And I, I, I fear that I have kept you a little bit too long. So I'm going to give you these five real quick. And I'm going to ask that you think on them and meditate on them and pray on them. Okay, in your own time. All right, so let's go ahead and get it done. All right, number one. Uh, so what are our options? One option is to fail to respond. Fail that we don't do anything. That I mean, that's I wouldn't call that a legitimate option, but it is an option. We could. Fail. That's one of the ways people respond. They just fail to respond. Some don't do anything because they're lazy. Some have this 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 thing. Of, well, I just don't like conflict. Well, who? Who does? I don't like conflict, but I'm going to deal with it if it comes. Nobody likes it. It's not what, what I mean, nobody in the right mind likes it. All right? And then there are just some who are just scared, just afraid. Some who are just complacent. Well, just whichever way it goes, you know? So that, that's, the, that, that's an option that we could just fail to react, fail to respond. Do nothing. And there are far many people who are who are faced with conflict, but are doing nothing. Okay? That's what David's brothers were doing. That's what the troops out on the battlefield were doing. When David arrived on the battlefield, what were they doing? Nothing. Oh yeah, they were acting like soldiers. They were acting like they were going to fight. But when it came down to it, what did they do? They ran. Which brings, them, <laughs> brings me to the second option. Take flight. Run. There are those who won't do anything. Fail to respond, just won't do anything. They're scared, <clears throat> complacent, lazy, whatever the case might be, won't do anything. And then the other option is to run, to take flight. When conflict comes, take off. Okay? And then there are those that, thirdly, the, the third option, again, is, uh, is uh, not only are those that will fail to react, fail to respond, do nothing, there are those that will take flight, they'll take off and run like, like David's brothers did, like the troops did. Uh, and then there are those that will just freeze up, can't do anything. Not just that they don't want to do it, can't. They're there stuck like Chuck, like a deer in the headlights, frozen. You know, it's, it's almost amusing sometimes when I hear people going into battle or entering into law enforcement or, or just on the streets, you know, who always talking about, man, if I was in that situation, well, if I ever did it, you know, and I always boast about what they're, well, if they bother me, I'll do this and I'll do that. You know, we used to hear guys on the battlefield, man, when I, I get in my first firefight, I'm going to do this, do that. We look around, you know, the guys that were experienced, we look around and be like, because even those of us who were experienced, and had spent time in the jungle, spent time fighting. We didn't even know how we would respond at the next fight. So this joker just come in here, uh, you know, like he, somebody just dropped him off the back of a turnip truck. And, ah, yeah, man, once I get out there, I'm going to do that. And then when they're faced with conflict, they freeze. <laughs> That's not funny. No, it's not funny. They freeze. So what are our options, right? Fail to do anything. <laughs> we can take flight. We might freeze, freeze up, all right? And then there's kind of the natural response for many of us, and that is to fight. It's just uh, 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 instinct, if you will. It's just, uh, 
impulse or, or, or instinct. It's just it's just kind of a you know a, almost like a, a natural reaction. Like you know somebody slaps you and then you just slap them right back. No thought in it. Just pop, you know, boop, boop, you know, just like that. Not everybody would do that, but there's some people that just instinctively you know just lash out. Now that's not always good. <laughs> okay, so you know in that sense of fight, you know, where we just sort of a uh, uh, just, re you know, react like that, okay? Um, but that's the way some people deal with it. All right, so let me get, that's four. Number five, and finally, uh, number five, by faith, face it. Conflict, I mean, by faith, face it. Deal with it. Pray about it. And do as David did. Lord, shall I pursue? And if God gives me the word, pursue. That's my reaction. That's my response. And by faith, I shall pursue. Likewise, if God says, no, don't pursue. By faith. Even though I feel the urge to respond, to get this monkey off my back, to get rid of this enemy, if God says, no, let me handle it. Let me deal with it. By faith, I back off and I let God handle it. And I just stand still and watch the salvation of the Lord, the deliverance of the Lord. Amen. Confronting conflict. When we confront conflict, don't worry. God has everything under control. Study these uh, uh, thoughts that I've given you. Meditate on them. And, you know, I believe there's some good there. So glean whatever good you can find out of this whole conversation, <laughs> okay? And may God bless you, and may God keep you. Father, we thank you so much for speaking to us and speaking through us. Continue to bless and be with us and keep us is our prayer. We love you, and we thank you for loving us. Bless now, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, my friend. And you go on and have yourself a wonderful week. Uh, this is hump day, so we're getting over the hump. Amen. And of course, you know what?